Hello, everyone. Welcome and thanks for coming today. Um, this is the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar, How the Beaver Shaped Canada with Dave Taylor. My name is Stephanie Keeler. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I'm hoping you are all doing well and staying safe. Before we get to today's presentation, I would just like to mention that all of our other March events are now live at the riverwoodconservancy.org. So go there to sign up for other webinars and also our first trivia night that has limited team capacity left. Um, a special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation for making these programs possible. And if you have the financial means today to support our programming, please give at the riverwoodconservancy.org. We would really appreciate that. And today we have Dave Taylor, our resident wildlife photographer and expert, also the author of over 40 books on wildlife and ecology. And Dave has also produced educational videos and material about wildlife for school curriculum. If you have any questions for Dave today, please type them in the Q&A chat in Zoom. And for those watching on Facebook, I will also try to get to them as well. I will turn things over to Dave now. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you all for coming. I'm pleased to see there's such a, an interest in beavers. And you'd be surprised to know how common beavers are in places like Mississauga. Oakville, Burlington, Toronto, uh, all along the lakeshore there. You can visit just about any pond and you probably have a good chance of seeing some sign of beaver. Uh, they're certainly active at Riverwood. I'm going to start out by showing a short video. So bear with me while I do the share screen thing. And here we go. And you should be seeing a video come up. And Stephanie will tell me if it's not working. So I call this video Cranky Beavers. This was photographed within the Sasaga's boundaries. And these beavers are down by the lake shore. And I was sitting there watching the lodge and the beaver came up and you can see this is mother beaver and she does not want Junior uh, stealing her food. And you might be looking at these and thinking, well, geez, these are big, big rats. They're just like, and they are kind of related to rats. They're a type of rodent, but they are certainly big. They are the second largest rodent in the world. The only larger one is the capybara. They can weigh up to oh, over 20 kilograms. Uh, there were two beavers in Mississauga that were actually mistaken for, believe it or not, black bears. Because when they come out of the water, they look very, very dark. And I guess people saw them coming out of the water and thought, oh, that's a bear. Uh, and then they thought, no, it's too small to be an adult bear, it must be cubs. It turns out they were in fact beavers. No, not very happy. So I'm gonna stop that. Uh, I hope, stop share. And I'm gonna go into my slide talk here. So we have to move around a little bit. Let me stop this again. And I hope you are seeing a slideshow. So I'm going to assume you are. So we're going to talk about beavers, both in natural and cultural. If we were to go back 400 years in time. Hey, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we do not see your slideshow. Okay. Hang on a second. Sorry about that. My apologies. I'm back on you. Share. I forgot to push this button. There we go. Awesome. Right. Perfect. Thanks. So just click on this, make sure I've got the controls. So we're going to talk about the natural and cultural history of beavers. And if we were to go back five, 600 years ago, before the Europeans arrived, we would have found a continent that was riddled from almost deserts to the Arctic tundra, from almost the floor, tip of Florida right up to the northern part of Canada, there would have been beavers. They were all over the place. And they were an important cultural icon for the Native Americans. But they were also um, respected. They, they weren't overutilized. Around 1500s, the French arrived into Canada and uh, in the English and the Dutch and the Germans arrived in what is now the United States and the Spanish. And it was the French in particular that had a taste for beavers, not necessarily 
eating the beavers, although, believe it or not, people who have eaten beavers they've trapped have said that the tail actually tastes like bacon. I have never, ever experienced it, nor do I want to. But what the French were interested in was the beaver pelt. And the French began trading with the Native Americans, the indigenous people. And as they did that, they started to expand. The French had a unique approach to their relationships with the indigenous folks. They would quite often marry into the family. Uh, they would marry Native women. Uh, they had children. And this gave rise to a group of people we call the Métis, um, who lived out west in Manitoba. And this was all driven by the, the trade for beavers. Now, what, what did they want with beavers? Well, beavers have, I'm just going to go ahead a few slides. They have long hair. And just think of your hair. Think of your hair as being the guard hair of a beaver. So that hair basically is what you see when you see a beaver. And I'm going to get to a photograph of a beaver. I'm going through some of these pictures a little quickly. Um, that hair is sort of the outer sky. But underneath that hair, think of cat fur. It's softer. It's thicker. And it, that is the fur that the fur traders wanted. So what they would do is they would catch, capture the beaver. They'd have to kill it. They'd trap it. They would then take the hide. And through a process that would happen probably over in France and eventually England, they would take this long hair off the beaver and it would give them this, this soft fur hair, furry hair, and they would make it into a mat. And then they would take that, become they would call it felt, and they'd make hats with it. So that was what the beaver was wanted for. Now, at the same time, people were looking at beavers and saying, oh, they're very industrious. So this legend grew up and you'll see French and English drawings from the period of the 1600s and the 1700s of massive numbers of beavers building huge dams, huge lodges. It became this notion that they were city builders. Well, beavers do have a real impact on the environment. They do cut down trees. They do eat trees. They, they eat the bark. In this case, the beaver that you're seeing is cutting through a tree, and he will drag a portion of it into his lodge. Now, they eat the Cambian area, that the area around the edge of the tree called Cambian area. It's, it's soft. It's tender. It's where the nourishment is. They do not eat the bark or the wood itself. So this beaver is going to carry that down. Now, if it's not an edible type of tree, and they have their preferences, he'll use it to build a dam. And these dams can be several meters high. They can be several. One of them was almost, I think there are records of it being over a kilometer long. So the beaver would take this and come back. And they would cut trees down. And what, typically, they're like that. But they can be as big as that. And bigger tree, they will girdle. And if you go down to Port Credit, uh, Saddington Park, you can see where a beaver has girdled a tree, a fairly large tree. And he's taken all the bark off. Without that bark there, the tree will die and eventually fall down. The beaver probably would be foolish to waste his time trying to cut through it. The secret of a beaver's success in cutting down trees is its teeth. It has two sets of incisors. And you see how orange they are. That orange is really hard material on the teeth. But the white stuff that makes up our teeth, the calcium, that is softer. And so as the beaver chews, the inside of the tooth wears away, and the orange stays out and doesn't wear away as quickly. And it gives you a sharp edge. And so the beaver, when it's biting, will cut through, wear its teeth down. Eventually, the orange wears it, but the teeth keep growing. And if a beaver, for some reason, stops to do this, the teeth have been actually actual cases of this where the teeth have grown around and actually grown into the skull of the beaver and killed the beaver. I can't imagine why that would happen. It must have been a sick beaver in the first place, but it has happened. So the beaver cuts down trees, and it's doing some really good stuff for the environment. We'll get back to that in a while. So. The French came, 
their approach was to work with the native people, marry into the family. The English came into Canada and the United States and their approach was to trade. So they would bring in trade goods. And if you go to uh, Mississauga, there's a street called Council Ring. Council Ring was named after what would happen at the mouth of the Credit River, where first the French and then the uh, English would meet to trade with the, uh, the tribe, most recently the Mississaugans. They would trade for beaver skins and beaver pelts and other pelts. And Mississauga's history actually started, the fact that the Credit River was originally called Le Credit, which meant credit. Well, what happened is the natives would bring down the, the trade, the, the, fever, the bird, beaver uh, furs, and they would trade with the Europeans at the mouth of the Credit River. And they would trade for things like muskets and pots and pans and knives and whatever else. And then they would go in. Well, the English quickly figured out that the better way to do this was to cut out the middleman. And they would go in and they would hunt the beaver and trap them themselves. And the Americans were really good at this. So by 1812, the Americans were going in after beaver and they pretty much trapped out the East Coast and most of Ontario. So they were going into the interior, which at that time actually belonged to France. But that didn't matter. They just went in and they started trapping. And they would have rendezvous and huge parties where Americans, French, uh, Native Americans would all get together in places like Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And they would have a great old time trading and drinking and, and having fun. And everything was going along tickety-boo until about the 1830s. And then it all fell apart. The fashion for beaver hats, beaver felt hats died off. There was no market. This is sort of like we experience with any marketplace. Eventually it changes. And so this whole commerce started, or stopped rather. But it left the poor beaver in a rather poor position because it had nearly trapped out to the point where there were very, very few beavers left. Now, Canada exists because of the beaver. It was the, the desire to find new trading places that led people like McKinsey to go across uh, Canada to find new ways of trading. It, it led to the formation of the Hudson's Bay Company, whose primary source of income was beaver pelts back in the 1700s. Um, it led to Canada being explored and opened up. And basically it's why on our nickel, we have a beaver and why the beaver is the emblem of Canada. But we just about got rid of our emblem. Fortunately, Canada is a big place and not as exploited as the United States and the beaver managed to survive. Now we get into a period where the beaver gets neglected. In fact, it's not really wanted. In the 1800s, early 1900s, we had an attitude towards animals that was kind of, well, you know, we're blessed by God to have dominion over all of the animals, and the beaver really doesn't do much for us. It was good for fur, but we don't need it anymore. So we kind of didn't do much about it. And then we started in the late 1800s, early 1900s, 100 years ago, to get into the notion of ecology and ecosystems and the value of animals. And the beaver was one of these animals that was one of the first to benefit because we realized that the beaver by building dams was controlling water flow. It was controlling erosion. It was making our streams healthier. We needed to have this animal. So there started to be a restoration. Now I was born in 1948. In 1948, in the early fifties, there was actually a law in Ontario that said no beaver was allowed south of the Highway 401. Fortunately, the beavers can't read. And they disobeyed the law and they moved in. And the problem people saw with beavers was they would cut down trees and they would take down stands of forest or they would flood our roads. So there was still this attitude that they weren't great. And it's an attitude that persists to today. In California, there was a group of indigenous people who had their own 
tribal lands and they wanted to, and this is just recent, they wanted to um, reintroduce beavers into their traditional hunting grounds, the traditional land, because they had water problems. They were, if you know anything about California, faced with terrible fires. And the studies had shown that when a beaver comes in, it may build a dam and have a little pond that may be an acre or two, but the water flows underground and they recover 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 acres. And those 50 acres wouldn't burn because the trees were moister than the trees for the, that were further away from the beaver. So people started to realize that this group of indigenous people, and I can't pronounce the name of their tribe, they decided to bring the beaver in. Well, they weren't allowed to. So what they did is, well, if we can't have real beavers, we'll build false beaver dams, and they built them. In Washington, DC, Washington State, another group actually successfully lobbied the government for permission to reintroduce the beavers. And beavers have been reintroduced into places like Scotland and England. And there was a lot of angst. Should we have them brought back because of all of the problems they could create? Well, they brought them back and they now have, for the first time in I think 100, 150 years, I may be wrong on the dates, beavers living in Scotland and Northern England. Uh, and they're doing what they're supposed to do, helping improve the water conditions. Now, there is a second species of beaver called the European beaver. Now, our beaver tends to build lodges. And these are these big huts that you've seen pictures of. And they build dams. The European beaver, because of the nature of the country, tended to live in banks and not build lodges, but they're pretty much identical. So there is some concern about genetically causing one species to become extinct, um, and they are trying to keep them separate, but the beaver has been successfully reintroduced or repopulated using European beavers in Europe. And we're doing a great job. Now, in Mississauga, we don't have to worry about repopulating beavers. You can go in many places and you'll see beavers. And this is a picture of a beaver doing a tail slap. So the tail goes up, comes down with a big like that, and the beaver dives under the water. It's basically telling all the other beavers there's danger here. As I've been working on a documentary for the last year almost on uh, beavers, uh, the one thing that I've had a hard time catching is a beaver actually slapping its tail because the beavers in Mississauga and the GTA have become habituated to people. They're really used to people watching them. And so they don't slap their tails They unless you're in a place where they don't expect you. And I found that a little frustrating, but at the same time, I'm just delighted to be able to be within a few meters of a beaver and watch it eat, watch it discipline its kids or its kits as they're called. Uh, it's been a remarkable experience for me. Underwater, the beaver is an amazing swimmer. At this time of year, they don't even have to emerge above water to get food. If you go to a beaver lodge and there's one at Sam Smith Park where you can really see this, that's at the foot of Kipling Avenue. Uh, right out of the spit, there's a large beaver lodge. And if you look just in front of it, you'll see all sorts of twigs standing up. Well, the beaver has been carrying food in for the last four or five months and building up a, a larder of food. So when it freezes over, it can go out from its lodge, swim underwater, grab what it wants, and take it into its lodge and eat it. They are air-breathing mammals. They can stay underwater for 15 minutes or so. And I've been in some ponds where the beaver has been at one end of the pond, and it would have taken me a good four or five minutes to walk to the other end. And I've seen a beaver go under at one end, and within a minute or two, maybe three or four minutes, come up at the far end. They're amazing swimmers. So if you're watching beavers and they disappear on you, don't think they're going to come up within five or six feet. They could come up within meters and meters. These zoo, these pictures were taken and and zoo displays, and you can see that the beaver is entering underwater. Now, sometimes the water drops, particularly in Lake Ontario, and you can actually see the entrance. 
Some of these entrances would be big enough for a person to crawl into. I would not recommend it because there are all sorts of fleas and parasites that might be living in there. Also, other animals live with the beaver lodge, including muskrats and I've seen birds nesting on them. I'm sure mice live in there. Beavers do build dams and they do cut down trees and that gets them in trouble with people. So when a beaver builds a dam, it floods an area. If that area is in the middle of nowhere, it's not a big deal. But if it floods an area where people are trying to have roads or it's their part of their grazing land or it's affecting their house, people get upset about it. And then the beaver is usually trapped. I think there's also a tendency for people to want to get rid of beavers because they think they're cutting down too many trees. And this is something I think we as a society have to come to terms with. Yes, beavers cut trees down. And yes, it can change the nature of the environment. But it also, it's a natural process. It's keeping water in the environment. It's helping clean our streams. It's making it for better fish habitat. Salmon particularly, because they need clean streams to lay their eggs in, salmon and trout. So the beaver has a role to play. And the fact that your, your forest is disappearing, that's a short-term effect. But unfortunately, we tend to think in terms of very short-term periods. So if my forest is gone in five years, I don't think that in 30 years, the forest will be back. But in fact, it will be. And it will be healthier because of the beaver. I just find these animals are magnificent creatures to watch and to observe in the wild. This one you can see is cutting down trees. It's just at the bottom of the screen in the middle. Their tail is flat. Some people object to it um, the, because it's, it's naked. People, it reminds people of rats, um, but it's very utilitarian. They'll sit on them. They have in their claws, the back claw has got a split claw which allows them to groom their hair. They spend a lot of time grooming each other. They're very social animals. There you can see a beaver eating grass. We think of beavers eating mostly trees. In fact, the all sorts of plant material. It is the tree that sustains them through the winter. It's the tree that they build a lodge with, they build a dam with. Uh, it's a tree that will not wear down their teeth. But during the uh, spring, especially in the spring, they spend very little time, from my observations, actually feeding on bark and candy layers. They're eating plants, and a lot of plant material. It is in the winter that they turn to the trees primarily because they are a source of stored food, stored energy for them. And in the winter, they are still together. Males and females find one mate and they stick with them. They'll have a lodge of maybe five to Oh, probably five to six babies. Babies are called kits. The babies will help as they grow up. They'll help build dams. They'll help take care of the lodge. Eventually, they will expand. And if there's enough area, if the lake is big enough or the pond is big enough, they will stay in the same area. Now, what we found at Riverwood is we get beavers coming and going. The Credit River is not ideal beaver country. It's slow and sluggish for most of the year, but at this time of year, especially in March, it floods and the floods can be quite violent and they wash away our beavers. So we might have a beaver for a few months, or half a year, maybe a year. It's the lucky one that makes it through to a second or third year without having its home. But there are so many beavers in Mississauga. I would say probably in the neighborhood of, I'm gonna guess, 15 to 20 beaver lodges, and that's producing a couple hundred beaver a year, that when one beaver moves out or disappears, another one moves in. So at Riverwood, over the years, and I've worked at Riverwood for 17 years and walked the property for another 20 years on top of that, beavers have sort of come and gone and come and gone, but they're always returning. In the wild, where it's a natural area, They'll have one dam and then as they exploit that area, they'll build another one further up the river, further up the river. In Mississauga, they cross to another stream. They go down to the lake, swim on the lake and go up another stream. 
they're always replacing themselves. So if you're gonna control beavers, unless you go wholeheartedly into it, if you take one beaver out, it's going to be replaced by another beaver. They are really um, doing quite well, as long as they're not trapped almost to extinction. The other thing they were trapped for was something called castorium. And I remember once being up at a cottage up in uh, uh, north of Huntsville and watching a beaver and they'll come ashore and they put this pasty material on the edge of the shore. And if you bend down and you sniff it, it's actually their urine and they mix it with mud and whatnot. And if you sniff it, it's got this really potent smell to it. It's the beaver's way of saying to other beavers, this is my land, stay away. But some people thought that it could be used for perfumes or for medicines. So they collected it. And that was one of the reasons they would hunt the beaver even now to collect its glands to make um, these other products. Probably didn't know that. I think the beaver is here to stay. And now is not a good time to see them because of the cold weather. But once we start to get some warm weather coming up, you can go to almost any pond just in the evening, early morning, stand around for an hour or so. If you find a lodge, you'll probably see a beaver. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that and we'll stop and take some questions. So I should be back on screen with Stephanie. How are we doing? Just one second. Can you see me now? I can see you, yep. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. Um, great presentation. I will say for those of you watching on Facebook, I am sorry for the frustration that you are dealing with. We are also frustrated with all the spam that's coming through. Oh, um, yeah, I'm trying to manage it as much as possible. So I'm sorry about that, but do not click on any link. <laughs> that's all I'll say. Um, not we, yeah, not from us. So we do have a lot of questions for you coming in, both on Facebook and in Zoom. And if you have more questions in Zoom, you can uh, put it in the chat or you can put it in the Q&A panel as well. Um, let's see, what will we do first? How long do beavers stay with their parents? Pro with, again, probably for about a year or so. Uh, males will leave generally first. Uh, females might stay along a little bit later. But once a new uh, family arrives, it gets a little crowded in the lodge. So they tend to move on and find their own territory. I, but if there's enough food and whatever, the, then the other beavers will build a lodge. The idea though for the males is to find their own mates. They don't want to mate with the, the family members. So they tend to disperse further. Females may stay around and another male may come in and join them. Okay, awesome. Uh... How do they live in ice cold water or are they on the land during the winter? They live in their lodges. Uh, kind of think of it as like winter is uh, COVID and you have to be isolated for a period of time. So the beavers will stay in their lodges. The lodges are so thick that you know I've heard of a grizzly bear trying to dig through one and it took them a long time to do it. So once they're in the lodge, they have a little place for their washroom. They have a little place to sleep. Uh, it's dry. There's enough room in there for them to eat. If you get, if you're lucky enough to get close to a lodge and it's early in the morning, or late in the evening, you might actually be able to hear the beavers moving inside. So the lodge has got lots of air. It's got lots of warmth. They got food underneath the ice. They will go out and get it. And if push comes to shove, they will gnaw through the ice and, and get out if they have to. But getting out in the winter is very dangerous because wolves love to dine on the beavers. And so do coyotes, I would imagine, but smaller ones. Awesome. And there's a lot of people asking as well. There's many different questions coming in, Dave, about where the best place to see beavers is in Mississauga. I know you kind of addressed this, but do you want to say it again, just because we're getting a lot of questions? And I'm not going to send anybody to a specific area because yeah. of COVID and I don't think... But in general, what I found is any place there's a pond, there's probably a good chance of seeing beaver there. So I mentioned Sam Smith, that's an excellent spot. 
the promenade. Uh, there was a beaver there. Hopefully it'll be back. Uh, but any of the ponds along the lake shore, you can see beaver if you walk the trail on Arendale, there's a beaver that's active down there. There's beaver all up and down the Credit River. Any park in Cred the Credit River could possibly have beaver in it. Uh, the Meadowvale Conservation Area is another area that uh, probably will have beaver very close to it, if not in it. Um, in Oakville, along 16 Mile Creek, mouth of Ronnie Creek, um, you go over to Leslie Street Spit, there's a really active beaver colony, but you're gonna have to walk a couple of kilometers to get there. Um, they're just, they're just all over the place. Uh, I started out because one of the staff members at Riverwood told me about a beaver she was seeing. We went down to see it and I thought, well, this is kind of cool. I'll take some video. And then suddenly I got immersed in it and I've spent probably several hundred hours standing around watching beaver. And sometimes you have to stand for an hour before the critter shows up. So be patient. They're not tame animals. <laughs> And we're getting a lot of questions from school groups as well. So if you are watching with your class today, we would really appreciate if you could post um, the number of students that you have in your class in the chat on both Facebook or Zoom, wherever you're watching, um, so that we can get a better understanding of the numbers today. Uh, another question coming from Sarah, are beavers social animals and do they share their lodge or space with other animals? Well, they certainly share it with muskrat. Uh, it's not unusual to be watching a beaver lodge and see what you think is a little baby beaver swim out. And if you look at the tail, it's like a rat's tail, it's thin. That's a muskrat and they do, do live in the lodges. Um, I've seen birds nesting on the top of lodges. I've seen grebes nesting beside a lodge. Um, I've seen blue herons perched on them. Uh, as I said, wolves and grizzly bears and black bears all will hang around a lodge to see if they can get some food. Um, so there are animals that live in the lodges. I think mice, perhaps, and venal voles. Um, but muskrats, for sure, they're the most common resident. And they seem to get along fine. They don't seem to have a problem. I guess a follow-up question that's actually coming from me, Dave, is if you've ever been to the Toronto Zoo and there's the beaver display, yeah. um, the snapping turtle will actually go inside their lodge. Is that mm -hmm. just because they're in close proximity or is that something you think would happen in the wild too? Uh, I don't think it would happen in the wild very often because snapping turtles, from my understanding, a male snapping turtle pretty much spends his entire life in the water. It's only the females that come out and make the nests. Uh, although I have seen snapping turtles, male or female, on logs sunning themselves in the spring. But you can't sun yourself inside a beaver lodge. So I think it's probably in a natural situation. Yeah. Uh, okay. That would be my guess. Um, OK, another question coming from Lori. Do beavers travel from place to place over land, or do they only travel using waterways? Beaver will travel quite readily over land. Um, they're in one of the places I've been working. I've seen them venture probably up to an apple orchard, which was a good 50 meters away. But there's no reason if it can smell water from one river to another, it will travel over land to get it. They'll also travel through drainage ditches and sewers to get from one place to another. It seems kind of sad, uh, but that's the reality. Some places it's the only way in. But I think they're very good at cross, crossing from one river system to another. So you imagine the Credit River system, which is huge. I'm sure that the beaver from our system would quite easily get over to Bonnie Creek or 16 Mile Creek or the Humber River or Credit River or the Etobicoke Creek or whatever. I think it's just, uh, it's not a big challenge. The risk is that it's going to encounter a, uh, a predator, a dog or whatever, even. In, but beavers have really, like this is a, an old skull of a beaver. So the skull itself doesn't look very big, but then you got a neck and then you got the body and then you got the tail. And mostly you got these teeth. 
And if that beaver were to bite you, you are going to know it. Um, so animals, they come up to, and if a beaver stands up, like on its back feet, and it's going to face you, so, and it will do this to threaten the predator, it's an imposing animal. It would be eyeball to eyeball with a big wolf. So the wolf is going to have to try and get behind it and grab it by the, the neck. So in Mississauga and the GTA, I think they're pretty safe traveling across land. Uh, I think a coyote would be really pushed. Uh, probably cars would be their major threat. But yeah, they'd certainly travel. Long-winded answers. I apologize, people. Um, Alexandra's asking, when a tree falls down, how do beavers know how to react so fast? So I guess the question is kind of, do they have a plan or are they just chewing away, hoping it doesn't hit them? People th used to think that the beaver was so smart that it would chew on one side and the other side and then would direct the fall of a tree. We know that isn't the case because there are many beavers that are found crushed underneath the tree that they were chopping down. Uh, change in breeze, change of wind direction, just bad luck. Uh, it doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen. And you would think it would be best if the tree fell into the water, but I've seen quite a few trees fall on the land when water was really close. So um, I, they kind of try to do that, but I don't think they're very successful. They're not as smart as people think they are. All right, and we'll take two more questions if you have time, Dave. Yep. Uh, what sub? This is from Sherry. What substance is that? What substance makes their teeth orange? <laughs> oh, Sherry, I'm going to have to look that up because I can't remember. Do you know offhand, Stephanie? It's iron. Okay. So they but, they have that coating on the outside that's yeah. orange. That's yeah. iron. But it has a specific name. Oh, um, Lori, see a message from Lori saying it's iron too. Mm -hmm. I, what I read in another that had another term for it, but um, and actually just to give a little plug, if you're looking for the information about how the beaver lives, this is a really good book. I don't it looks backward to me, but it says Dam Builders. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out by my publisher uh, a few years ago by Michael Runtz. And if you're looking for the history of beaver, and it's mostly American in its focus, but it does mention Canada. And it says, for fortune and empire, this is a really good read. Um, and it will explain some of the history, although it goes into a lot more detail than I do. One more question. One more question. All right. Um, we actually have a question coming in from Twitter. Hmm. Um, and it's from a class. So why do beavers cut down trees? <laughs> They cut down trees for food, to build things with, like a dam and a lodge. Uh, they also uh, cut them down, I guess, because it stimulates other fruit growth. If you've ever cut down a tree or seen a tree that grows, you'll see you'll get these suckers coming out. And a lot of those suckers are just perfect beaver food. So by cutting down a big tree, it creates this undergrowth of suckers which are these small branches as the tree starts to regrow and they produce more food. So it's like growing its own product, if you like. The other thing about beavers that we should talk about just briefly is how important they are to the ecosystem. By damming up an area, eventually they run out of food and they leave the area and the dam breaks and what's left behind is a metal. And that provides food for deer and for moose and for all sorts of songbirds and for other insects and frogs and toads and all sorts of things. And they also have cleaned up the water. So it, it is an amazing um, source of material for other animals. So beavers are so important to our ecosystem um, that I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get a better understanding for, from them. I wanna thank all of you who asked questions. It was really great. I saw one come up again. The tail slap is used as a warning uh, in Michael Runtz's book, he talks about there's two types of tail slaps. One is like, get out of the area real quick. And the other is, go away, I mean, you're bothering me, type of thing. So lots to learn about beavers. And I'm hoping in July, I'll premiere my documentary on them. Yay. It was hopefully photographed, well, I think will be photographed entirely within 
well, mostly in Mississauga, if not entirely. And uh, I know I've run into some of the kids on the trails, uh, particularly from my daughter's class. I'll look forward to seeing you by the beaver sometime. And uh, a couple of the other people I know, I've seen the names come up. I'll see you someplace around there. Thank you very much for coming in and seeing us. And thank you, Stephanie, as always, for doing such a wonderful job. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, that was a great presentation. We have so many questions coming in, so I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Um, but you can always reach out to us if you have more questions from your class or um, if you're just an individual that has more questions as well um, at the riverwoodconservancy.org. Thanks, Dave, and thank you, CBC, once again, for making this possible. If uh, you do have the financial means to make a donation today, please give at the riverwoodconservancy.org. We'd really appreciate that. And thanks for joining us again. Stay safe, everyone, and we'll see you next, see you in a month. next time. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>